Good afternoon, everyone. What's your second name again, Scott? I'm, I'm sorry? Your second name. Scott, uh, last name is Tiller. Tiller, okay. Better food for thought. Lecture series. Great to see the seminar uh, over here. People from different uh, disciplines, uh, different uh, uh, areas as well. I'm so glad. Uh, today we have a very special topic, uh, the topic of uh, not just academic interest, but also uh, interest from uh, general citizens and uh, from all around the world because of <coughs> that event, Hurricane Harvey. So I'm so glad to have uh, Professor David Maitland to give the <coughs> lecture today. Uh, let me introduce him by reading the bio. Dr. David R. Maitland is the Jose M. Harthy Centennial Professor of Civil Engineering at UC Austin, where he has been on the faculty since 1981. He is a surface water hydrologist and was elected in 2016 to the National Academy of Engineering for application of geographic information systems to hydrological processes. Since 2014, he has been helping the National Weather Service to develop a new national water model to forecast water conditions, like weather in real time and local scale throughout the continental US. Let's welcome Professor Main. Okay, thank you. So, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Hurricane Harvey. First of all, what kind of an event it was, uh, what we did here at UT Austin to help with the response, and then a, bit, a little bit about where we're going in the future with some of the research so that we can do this better. Uh, this picture is in the SOC. Who knows what the SOC is? Got any SOC people here? Yeah, the SOC stands for the State Operations Center. So this is the nerve center for the whole state for the rest, for the recovery, or in the response to Hurricane Harvey. And it's located in the Department of Safety, Public Safety Building at the corner of uh, Lamar and 2222. Uh, so just out on the north side here. So there's those white DPS buildings where you go to get your driver's license. Well, two floors down under the ground, there is the SOC. And so the whole nerve center, of, there were hundreds of aircraft and uh, helicopters, there were thousands of trucks and boats and tens of thousands of personnel. Everything's coordinated at the SOC. And there's a briefing uh, every morning, uh, and this is a part of the briefing here, where you see weather and then the estimate of risk. The purple bar on the bottom there is just flood for the next five days <laughs> is purple. That's bad. Anytime you get purple, uh, the, the SOC people pay attention. So this is Harvey. Uh, Harvey is the largest storm for its duration that has ever happened in the nation. Uh, it started, so the, the, it made landfall on the evening of Friday, August the 25th. But really, the SOC was active uh, on Monday, the Monday before. And by Tuesday, it was clear that something really serious was going to happen. And then the level of severity ramped up as the hurricane Ooh. increased in severity from the blue, which is tropical storm, through the green and up into the orange and reds, which are successively higher levels of hurricane. Uh, the hurricane came ashore about 10 o'clock at night in Rockport with uh, as a Category 4 hurricane with winds of 130 miles an hour. And that's the big red uh, center that you see there. However, around this you can also see there are rain bands, and there's one over Houston. So the hurricane never got anywhere near Houston, but even so, it deluged Houston. And it did so because there are these big rain bands that are around the edge of the hurricane uh, not the center of the hurricane itself. Uh, on the east side of Houston is Beaumont Port Arthur. So we went into the SOC on Tuesday, uh, let's see, this was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, here. And they said, oh, there's been 26 inches of rain on Beaumont Port Arthur last night, it's now Venice. So there was actually, they consider three presidential level disasters happened in Harvey. The first was a wind disaster in the Rockport Corpus Christi area where the, f the high winds just tore up the landscape. Then there was a rain disaster in Houston, and then there was another rain disaster, rain flood disaster in Beaumont Port Arthur. So the equivalent of three, what individually would have been a disaster by itself. <coughs> so I, I've made a mark here that's five days long. You can see the intense hurricane and then the, all along the green there. And for that duration, uh, 
this blue line, this, prep, this orange line here represents how much rain happened as a function of the area of the storm. So if you look at the worst area of the rainfall that happened from 1,000 square miles to 100,000 square miles on the horizontal axis, and then the rainfall depth on the vertical axis, the orange line is Harvey, and the blue dots are the worst storms that have ever happened in the nation's history. So for five days duration, if you take the average difference between the blue dots and the orange line, that's 11 inches of rain. Now, 11 inches of rain is a catastrophe all by itself. Harvey was 11 inches of rain on top of the combination of all the worst storms that have ever happened in the history of the country. So this was, yeah, they, they talk about off the charts. Well, yeah, okay, this is off the charts. Um, which, having spent 40 years teaching people about charts, is a little distressing, I have to say. <laughs> so for two days, Hurricane Harvey was equivalent to the worst recorded storm in US history. For three days, it was five inches more. For five days, it was 11 inches more. And this data came from John Nielsen Gammon, who is our state uh, climatologist. Uh, this is the Texas Division of Emergency Management that controls emergency response in our state. That's Chief Nimkid. He's the director of TDEM. He was formerly the fire chief of the city of San Antonio. And the way that the emergency response is organized is that the state's divided into regions that are indicated by these uh, green areas here. Then within those into disaster districts, and then within the disaster districts there are counties, and within the counties, within the counties there are cities. So it's a hierarchical system where if there's a small problem, the cities just deal with each other. You know, if there's a larger problem, the counties get involved. If there's a huge problem, they request resources from the state, and all, this is the system that's used to coordinate that. So every morning at the SOC, the first thing that happens is a weather briefing and an anticipation of what's going to happen uh, over the next day, and then the disaster district coordinators from each of these districts that are coloured in here, they get called to say what's the situation in their district. Uh, what level of disaster alert are they at? What resources do they need? Do they have additional requirements than, than they were able to articulate earlier? And so they go around the, all the disaster districts uh, and then they start figuring out how to allocate the resources. Uh, so this is what it looks like inside the SOC. There's about 120 people there. Uh, everyone, you see these vests? Yeah, that, those vests are important. So the vests represent roles. So when you go there, you have a role, and you might be a hydrologist, maybe, or meteorologist or something, or maybe you're a finance. They have a finance section because, you know, you're spending money so fast that they have to keep track of how much money's being spent uh, to know what to do. And so everybody's got a role. And you make, in, the, in full operations, the stock runs 24 hours a day, uh, on a 12-hour schedule. So that it's uh, 7 in the morning, uh, they rotate off, the, the night shift rotates off, and then the day shift comes on. Um, so the, the red things at the top there represent different functions. So logistics, finance, uh, prediction, there's a number of uh, functions there, and then the people underneath them are the ones who handle that. Uh, just as a, as a marker, the death toll in Katrina was 1,800, and the death toll in Harvey was 80. Now, I don't want to minimize 80 people dying because every death is a tragedy, but 80 is not 1,800. So yes, we had an enormous storm here, but the response was pretty effective, actually, relative to Katrina. In the emergency response community, uh, they, have a f they have something called the Katrina effect, and they're, they're so chagrined at the lack of capability to respond in Katrina that now they lean forward because of Katrina. So at the SOC, every day, the this, as the hurricane was happening, uh, if the hurricane was tropical storm, they planned for Cat 1. If it's Cat 1, they planned for Cat 2 and so on. In other words, they're planning all the time for a level of severity one step higher than the current condition uh, uh, that's being experienced. Uh, this is some pictures from Beaumont. Uh, <laughs> it's a crazy situation. So uh, by this time, five days in, uh, all of the urban search and rescue teams that can be brought to Texas from the around, around the nation were here. There are 26 urban search and rescue teams that uh, can be mobilized, and the, for the first time, they were nationally mobilized and they're in Texas. So when this thing happened in Beaumont, Port Arthur, it was just an all-out assault. The air over Beaumont, Port Arthur was so thick with helicopters they couldn't get any more in. It's like 85 helicopters up at one time. And, and you see the, the winch here, so where a helicopter comes in, the, op the uh, operator goes down on the winch, gets the victim, uh, cinches them up to the, to the operator, and then they haul them up again on the winch. 
And this is dangerous work. I mean, they're spinning around in the air. Uh, often the victims are in trees, so you can, now you're, you're hauling somebody out of a tree and you're gonna drop down into the tree yourself and then get back out through the tree again. Uh, so the smaller helicopters do that work and then they shifted the victims to uh, high points and then the bigger helicopters, the one on the left there is a Chinook and that, that takes the, the, you know, the people are going up the ramp there and then they take them out to Galveston and so on. So the smaller helicopters are rescuing out of the water and off the rooftops and the bigger ones are evacuating the people out of the area. Um, and just you know, watching the mechanics of all this happening, it was just an experience. It's, it's the most intense 10 days of my life that I've ever had. I mean, the, you just cannot describe the intensity. Uh, one of the things that happens is nobody speaks as loud as I am. <laughs> you know, they all speak quietly, e all the time. This is kind of an unwritten rule, you do not shout. Because the, everyone's trying to keep themselves under control. The pressure is so, then there are no incidental conversations. You know? Everybody's so preoccupied with what they've got to do now that there's, there's just, it, when nobody chats. <laughs> um, <coughs> and uh, Scott Tiller is here. Uh, Scott is with Texar and was involved in this rescue. Do you want to say a little bit about what you're doing, Scott? Uh, so Texar is uh, Texas Search and Rescue. We're a volunteer group of 350 people across the state. Uh, and we are part of, uh, we, uh, like I said, we're all volunteers, but we will deploy at the request of a county judge, municipality, city, federal government. We work with FBI. We work with uh, uh, FEMA. We work with uh, TVA. Um, but we're deployed statewide, and through this particular incident, uh, we had 90 people on the coast. All of our fast water res rescue folks, as well as our rescue boat operators, were down on the coast. Uh, they just migrated north. We started out down in Corpus to work their way north as the individual communities uh, contacted us. My role in this was actually here in Austin, much like uh, 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 TVM. I was uh, uh, responsible for coordinating where our people went, how they got there, mm -hmm. because one thing. It's one thing to get down there. It's another thing to get from one location to the next through all the flooded roads and the conditions that were. So Scott's a GIS person, so he was using his technical skills to help with the deployment of this volunteer services, and I was helping the GIS team at the SOC do, deal with the same thing, you know, with all the resources that are uh, coming out from uh, other states. So Urban Search and Rescue is an organized thing. Uh, in Texas, we have Texas Task Force One, which is a, an organized system so that if a community is being flooded, other communities move in and help out. And uh, other states have those too. And what happened in Harvey was all of the, those resources from other states came to Texas. Uh, so in the middle of this, uh, uh, the, in the middle of this intensity, there's a guy called Country. Actually his name's Warren Wadley, but they call him Country. Uh, and I'm called Doc. I'm not Professor blah, blah, blah. I'm called Doc. People have names. And <laughs> it's another world. And I walked past his office, and Country was in charge of uh, USAR deployment. And he had 142 aircraft and helicopters. Every day, he says fly, they fly. And he, he said, Doc, come here. And he fixed me with like a stare, a thousand yard stare, and he said, Doc, I need data. And with a kind of grinding his teeth. And it was one of those situations where, you know, this, this is a no, this is a no fluff situation. So that night, the chief uh, kid asked the president of the university to uh, help out with expedited uh, water information. And so we got our faculty together, we got the Texas Advanced Computing Center involved, and we started uh, to fire things up. Now, there's an official river forecasting center uh, here called the West Gulf River Forecast Center. It's operated by the uh, National Weather Service and they forecast flows on big rivers. And you can see Texas is kind of a honeycomb here. Uh, so the Colorado River at Austin, for example, they, they actually forecast that, or Colorado River at Bastrop, at specific points. And so they are in charge of telling what's going on with the big rivers. Actually, Harvey wasn't that much of a river flood. It was mainly a rain flood, but nevertheless, that's uh, the function that they perform. And so they produce forecasts of flows at particular locations. So this happens to be the Brazos River near Rosharan. And this was a particularly critical location because the Brazos River flows on the west side of Houston and there are levees that separate the urban area in Fort Bend County from the Brazos River. And if that water goes over the top of those levees, Fort Bend County is just a disaster area even more than it already was. So they make these forecasts, so the vertical uh, heights here 
are in feet above uh, datum at the gauge and you can see the blue here is what's going on up to now and the projection is, uh, goes up into these other zones. So yellow is action, orange is minor, red is major, uh, sorry, red is moderate and purple is major. And so the, the SOC people, they pay attention when it's purple. Every, anytime you get something purple, yeah, it's, that's what they pay attention to. Um, so you can see here the, the hurricane came ashore uh, on Friday at this, well actually a bit later than this, about uh, 10 o'clock at night. And this is their projection for what's going to happen Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday on the Brazos River uh, near Rosharam. And that was a really important area uh, because of the, the risk of the flooding. And we saw a lot of pictures about flooding in Houston itself, but this, is, this could have been a disaster. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, also, what the um, official system was doing was, issue, was preparing inundation maps for flooded rivers. So the three rivers that, well actually there's five rivers here. Uh, this is the Guadalupe River, the Colorado River, uh, the Trinity River, Natchez and Sabine, and you can see some mapping also being done in Houston. So the Corps of Engineers in Fort Worth, US Army Corps of Engineers does that work, and they were s sending maps down to the SOC. So actually it was, <laughs> it was a bit of an interesting experience because we were here in this little room, I mean a very, very small room, maybe like the corner of this room, and boom, 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 these maps are coming in. It's all like Nolan Ryan throwing fastballs, you know. Oh, now we've got the another one for the base. Oh, another one for the Trinity. Okay, okay. <laughs> and frankly, we could not cope. In other words, the deluge of information that was coming in was more than the group that was there had the capacity to synthesize and mobilize while the event was happening. So sort of some of it got used and the rest just got kind of lost in the deluge. But the colors here represent uh, different water depths, and so that gives some sense of you know, what kind of uh, transportation you can have. Now, uh, what I've been involved with is a new system called the National Water Model, and this is, runs continuously over the whole country. Uh, so the prototype of this was built here in Austin at the Texas Advanced Computing Center um, in the fall of 2014 and the spring of 15, um, and then it was moved into the nation's uh, forecasting system so that now weather forecasting goes on in the main part of the National Weather Service's supercomputer environment, and over in the corner there's a water piece. And so water is being forecast continuously. This is a calculation across the whole country in three hour time steps for about a three month period uh, in 2015. Um, the work is coordinated at a new <coughs> National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, on the campus of the University of Alabama. And you may say, why Tuscaloosa, Alabama? Well, thank you, Senator uh, Shelby. Uh, it's his hometown. He wanted a federal presence in his hometown. Hey, is this a great country or what? Yeah. <laughs> there was a senator from Oklahoma who got made a speech, uh, critical of Shelby, said he was a porker. And so Shelby said, oh, Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, huh? I think I'd like one of those. Yeah, $50 million fell out the sky, so what can you say? Anyway, it, the, when that happened, it created the potential for thinking about hydrology at the national scale rather than at the regional scale as I was showing before. So instead of having 12 separate centers that each do forecasts on big rivers, you now have a single national system that forecasts over uh, the whole country. And so there's actually four different forecasts that are made. An analysis forecast, which was the best estimate of current conditions, a short range forecast for 18 hours ahead, a medium range forecast for 10 days ahead, a long range forecast for 30 days ahead. And of those uh, and all the data is made public, and it started as of the 16th of August 2016. Um, and we used all of these things, well actually the analysis, short range and medium range forecasts were the main ones that we used. Um, and so this is a forecast, um, a medium range forecast from the National Water Model uh, for the Brazos River uh, near Rosharan. It's forecasting the flow in much the same way uh, that I showed earlier with the water level. Now, one of the things that we've done here uh, at UT Austin is not simply dealing with how much water there is, but how deep is the water. So it's not just you know how much flow do you get, it's where, where is the water going to go. And we've developed a map called HAND. It stands for the height above nearest drainage. And what that means is if you measure a place on the land surface where somebody's living, and, and you say how high is that above the bottom of the nearby creek, then that's the HAND. And so if the water's depth is less than that, then you're not going to get flooded. If the water depth is greater than that, you get flooded. And we computed that map, a sort of relative elevation map, 
for the whole continental United States. We did this on the supercomputer system actually um, at Illinois and now it's here uh, being done in Austin. Another thing that we've done is that we've collected together the address points uh, for our whole state. Now you may not realize this, but if you get on your phone and say, I need an emergency help now, and you're in this building, this building has a dot on the top, literally. The, the, well, not painted on the roof, but the dispatcher is looking at a map, and on, the, and on this building, that dispatcher sees a dot, and they say, you know, fire goes there, EMS goes there, police go there. That's how it works. In Travis County, there are 355,000 of these dots. And so when you make a call, we have 34 public safety access points uh, around this area, and your call is routed to one of the, those public safety access points. Inside there, there's a dispatcher. The dispatcher sees a map. On the map, there's a dot <coughs> go there. And they say, seconds saves lives. So they make, they're really careful about where these dots are located because that's where you, they're going to send you. So in that emergency response is organized on a, uh, on a county level, sometimes within counties, sometimes with groups of counties. Here in this area, it's the Capital Area Council of Governments who does that. Uh, we went around the state and we gathered up all these points. So now we know where the people are for the whole state. That's an important piece when you've got a Harvey, right? Uh, there's a hole in the middle. What do you think this hole in the middle is? That's Fort Hood. Yeah, it's military. Yeah, you don't, you don't get information about Fort Hood. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we didn't have Corpus Christi either. The city of Corpus Christi wouldn't fess up their data uh, until Harvey was coming ashore. <laughs> <coughs> We had to waste this county, and there was a hole for Corpus Christi. <laughs> yeah, the, in the afternoon, the Harvey came ashore, <laughs> the data showed up yeah, from the city of Corpus Christi. And so what we've been doing is to take the national water model forecasts of discharge, and by this hand process, we've been converting those to estimates of depth, and then we've been spreading the water out to get inundation maps, and then we've been overlaying that on the address points to get estimates of the impact, so that we can say, oh, this is not just forecasting water, this is forecasting impact on people and infrastructure. And here's an assessment that, in retrospect, I think was pretty prescient. So on the 25th of August, at 1500 hours, that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that calculation showed the following, that TDAM Region 2, which is Houston and Southeast Texas, the, address, the projected address point flooded is 238,000 address points. And region 6, which is the bordering region, 22,000, then you see all the rest of them, hardly anything. So this assessment was made seven hours before the hurricane even made landfall. And what that means is that you could, the, the mechanics of this were such that before the hurricane got on the coast, we already knew there was going to be a catastrophe in Houston. And I wrote an email to my colleagues on the faculty and I said, um, there's, there's, a, there's a catastrophe coming. We, we, it will be overwhelming. We, we, cannot, um, we can't stop this. And I, I pray for the souls of my fellow Texans. I knew, you know, I knew what was going to happen. And I stood in the, in the sock while I was listening to the briefings going, Houston, Houston, Houston. No. I d we knew what was going to happen. And that's you know, when you think, so this is the benefit of large scale technology, big data, and all this kind of stuff that you can then say, uh, this was really a first, it was a one-off, it was the first time that we'd actually mobilized all of this. But actually, I, as I'm reflecting now, I can see this is a really important strategic thing for the future because what it says is you can get an estimate before a catastrophe happens of roughly where you think the impact is going to be and also how large that impact is going to be. And for strategic reasons, that's really critical. I think we could have started doing this on Tuesday. That was three days out before the hurricane got ashore and five days before the catastrophe started in Houston. So there's some promise here, there's some hope for better outlooks from large-scale effort that really hasn't been possible in the past. Um, one of the things that we uh, did was to fire up the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, and Chief Kidd did this on Sunday, and it has a, <laughs> there's a whole story behind how this happened, but uh, in the middle of the deluge, <laughs> we got the chief to request the federal government to fire up the National Water Centre. And with their help and with the help of the Tax Advanced Computing Centre, we started producing maps across the whole landscape. So I showed you before what the Corps of Engineers was doing on the main rivers, which is the dark blue. We started doing the mapping across, the, across everywhere so you can get a sense of the impact of the, over the whole landscape. This was about uh, 9,000 square miles of flooded area over 40,000 miles of rivers. Um, so. 
Oops, I showed you this earlier. Oh, this, this is a little bit of a better picture. See the little dots on top of the houses here? Yeah, you can see uh, those in a, in a clearer way on this picture. We've got a few more points at this point too. Now, with those data, what we were doing uh, was overlaying the mapping and estimating what the impact was, both at the river scale that you see here, which is for the Natchez River, and also at the local scale, uh, this is in Beaumont, for Urban Search and Rescue. Now the red lines that you see here are the US National Grid that's used for search and rescue. This is a Mercator projection, if you're into projections. Oh, you must be into projections, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, this is GIS geek stuff. Um, but just to give a sense, uh, once the TDM asked us to help, we had a coordinating call among the faculty at 9 o'clock every night, you know, because we're teaching during the day. This is the start of the semester. This <laughs> the regular semester is going on now. Uh, so we, had, we could only coordinate at night, and, it, and I remember one night we got the mapping about quarter to nine on those five rivers I showed you, and then we did this overlay, and about one o'clock in the morning we learned that the, there was going to be 170,000 people flooded on the Brazos River and 50,000 on the Colorado, and communicated that to the chief about two o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's a pretty sobering experience when you, you, know, you know the magnitude of the events that, that are going to happen. Um, we got our supercomputer system fired up, Stampede. Well, actually, we have Stampede 2 now, which is even better. Uh, so this is a fantastic system uh, that's out at the uh, Pickle campus. It's one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. Um, and it's capable of very large scale, very rapid computations so that we can do th this kind of mapping that you saw really quickly. And on the left here is uh, Harry Evans. Harry's my buddy in this. Uh, Harry was Chief of Staff of the Austin Fire Department for uh, six years and he was a firefighter for 29 years. And so he and I have been working together for the last four years actually. Um, and he's the public safety side and I'm the re research side. And you know, when different people get together, interesting things happen. And that's that, it was that partnership that's at the centre of this, the university being able to penetrate the public safety world and do something useful. And so Harry was actually uh, helping our country with the uh, uh, urban search and rescue and we were using these maps to help with that. Now, where are we going to go in the future here? So, the uh, 550 US Geological Survey stream gauges in Texas, that's what we have now. The National Water Model forecasts flows on 100,000 pieces of streams and rivers, including about 500 in Travis County, just to give you a sense. Uh, Waller Creek outside our building is one of them. It's in the National Water Model. Shoal Creek has three pieces in, in the National Water Model. So you know, it's at the level of urban creeks. Um, oh, but we've got 27,000 bridges sitting on those creeks. Ah, potential sensor platforms, right? Uh, we could go from 550 to 27,000. That would be cool. Um, and so we've been talking with TaxDOT about how that could happen. So this is there are 15,700 river reaches that the 27,000 bridges uh, sit on here. And so during Harvey, what we did was we opened up a portal for about 8,000 bridges uh, in the Harvey Impact area, which is this area in southeast Texas here. And because we had all the information organized ahead of time, I, I called TechStart about 10 o'clock on one morning and I said, hey, we, we could do a portal for you guys. Are you, are you interested in that? Oh, yeah, yeah, we could do that. That'd be good. So by 1 o'clock in the afternoon, they could see what the forecast situation was at 8,000 bridges. So this, I mean, if you'd said to me a few years ago, you know, we can forecast the flow at 27,000 bridges, I, you're crazy, there's just no possibility. But that, all that's gone. And one of the things I've learned out of this experience is I've been a laptop computer person my whole life, but boy, these high performance computing things, they just crush this. You know, there's an enormous economy of scale here that you can do things that are just you know, unbelievable, un, unimaginable almost. Uh, in the, in the scale of what we've been accustomed to. So one of the th so this system, and we built this with a company called Kistas, which is actually based in, in Germany. Uh, we take a particular location and say, here's the discharge forecast that comes from the National Water Model. What's the corresponding water level that we expect uh, there to be at that location? And so this is an example of the uh, portal uh, where the 8,000 bridges were exposed for tax dot, and the, the green colours that you see here. Um, and the other blue dots are gauging stations at different places in the state. Um, so we've 
gone to TaxDOT and we said we could start measuring the flow off of bridges using radar measurements. So we can say, okay, now we've got a radar that points straight down that tells the level, we have a radar that points out and by a Doppler effect it measures the velocity, and by combining those two things you can get uh, the flow at that, at that location. So we've made a proposal to TaxDOT and said, hey, why don't we do this on the interstate highway system? So if you're going to sample something, hey, we've got transects here, right? We have I-10, we have 20, we have 35, 45. So if you think of this from a scientific perspective, it's not just dropping dots all over the landscape. We've got a systematic sampling system here uh, that we could be using. So after a period of wonder, they said, okay. So now we're starting this project with TaxDOT and we're going to install this equipment at, at 20 locations on I-10 that you see here. So the, the, the hook there is at San Antonio. It goes, I-10 goes up towards uh, Kerrville and then uh, from San Antonio right out to the Louisiana border. And so this is really a new idea in flow measurement. It's like, okay, how, what's the care and feeding of a highway, right? How do we think about the flood security of a highway? And one of the things that I learned in Harvey was the road system is crucial. <laughs> As hydrologists, we worry about the stream system, but whoa, no, 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 the road system is crucial because that affects access and egress. Um, the, the, thing, the question that we got asked most of all right at the beginning of Harvey was, where can we do staging? So all of these resources are flowing in, trucks, airports, helicopters, you know, who knows what. And so they want to have, oh, I need a high point. I need a place where I can get in by road and out by road. That was the crucial question. That's what we needed to know. I mean, you think, well, duh, you know, we know where the high points are. Well, no, we didn't know where the high points were as it turned out. So there's some easy things that we should know and understanding the impact of flooding on the road system is really a, a central piece of this. Um, another thing that I think is interesting is uh, there's this company in, in Wimberley called Fishview. And this is like rivers for, like Google Street View for rivers. So they have can canoes and they go along and they, uh, you, can, you can actually go, yeah, if you just Google Fishview and you can go on a little tour down the river, like in a canoe. And you can look around and all this kind of stuff. It's really cool, yeah. Um, and I think that we need to combine all this, you know, high level data with things like this so that we can actually see when a flood happens when the water's rising, we can visualize what's actually happening. And so this is, I think this video uh, background is, is really important. So let me summarize then. Um, Hurricane Harvey was an historic storm. This wasn't, this, this was uh, bigger than anything that we've ever had in Texas. The current estimate um, of the cost of Harvey is that it's the second most expensive hurricane in the history of the country after Katrina and the total costs are not yet compiled, and it could end up being bigger than Katrina. It's that large. Um, being in the State Operations Center was, was a very intense experience. When I went in there, Harry said, pace yourself, pace yourself, because the pressure is so great. And we were there during the day, and when, then we were doing analysis at night, <laughs> and we were doing all the stuff that I was describing, we were working it, so it's just day and night. Um, the flood response that the state mounted, with the help of lots of federal and other people, volunteers and so on, I think was pretty effective. Now, I didn't hear a lot of blowback in the press of, you know, nursing homes that got flooded and people were stranded and uh, all things like what you heard about in Florida. You know, we didn't have a Maria here um, in Puerto Rico. Uh, we did play a role here at UT Austin in helping during Harvey and also with the preparations before uh, Harvey got here. Um, and the, I think we need, a, you know, we've now been able to forecast on a much denser basis all across the, the country and certainly all across Texas. Um, and we need a lot more measurement than we have. And if you just take our county, inside of Austin, the city of Austin has 42 locations where they measure water level and 90 where they measure rainfall. But as soon as you get outside the city of Austin, poof, you're in Western Travis County, whoop, no, nothing out there, you know, this is where you're in the wild, so that's where I live. And uh, yeah, so being able to take a national system that can raise up all these other areas to something like what the sophisticated cities are doing on their own. That's sort of what's happening here. Okay, there we are. That's my story. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, 
So that's a really good question. So in order to do that, HASIS requires depth grids. So the, 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 the sort of the intersection between the, what we're doing with forecasting with HASIS is that. Now, we've got this height above nearest drainage thing which does give water depth. So the, the crosswalk is being able to translate those depth grids over. Now I've just, just was reviewing a couple of days ago some work like that that was done by FEMA itself and they were working not just with rivers but actually out in the streets uh, as well. So I think it's not just dealing with the rivers, it's dealing with the ponded water that's in the landscape itself. I think that's the real solution and that's where we need to connect with hazards. Yeah. Yes? Yes, yes. Yes, that's, that's a really good question. So, um, so HAZIS, for those who aren't into yeah, flood jargon world, is like, yeah, HAZIS is Hazard of the United States or something, right? Yeah, it's, it's a system that FEMA has for calculating the extent of damage. And the criteria that they want to achieve is to be able to estimate the number of structures flooded within 24 hours after the flood has happened and then to estimate the damage 48 to 72 hours uh, out. That, and so that means translating, you know, what's the degree of damage at each structure and being able to integrate that. Those are the goals. Um, that actually has an interesting uh, implication for the response. So let's imagine now you're stepping back and you can anticipate what those numbers will be. For the state, that affects how it acts because if you go over $35 million, you get a presidential disaster de declaration and federal money starts to flow in. If it's under $35 million, no, the state's on its own dollar. So if it can be estimated, you know, we're going to go over the $35 million threshold, they lean forward in the response. Uh, and th there's more things are done in anticipation that greater resources will become available once uh, the disaster is over. So yes, that question of being able to estimate damage is, is important uh, after the event because yes, the quicker that you can estimate the damage and prove that you've gone over the 35 million threshold, the faster the recovery funds come in. But if you could do that ahead of time, it could even affect the response actually. It's really an interesting situation. So the value of the individual properties and the infrastructure, <coughs> all, all, the, all the buildings that are there, there's a, there's a link between how much water we've got, and that's what you're predicting, and what the value is. Yeah, and, and and we're constantly trying to improve that, right? So, so the way it works is that you take a building and the, you type the building, right? Like, is it single family home? Is it multifamily apartment, et cetera? Um, how many floors does it have? Um, how deep is the water at the building? And then you take, when you're combining all those things, you have a percentage of the building structure which is damaged and a percentage of the contents and those two numbers come together and then you have to integrate that across all the infrastructure that's flooded. That's how the estimates are made. So you infer those things from how much water Yes, yes, that's correct. And it builds off census data. Yes, and it's, and there's, there's new research coming out, for example, to be able to use automated interpretation of aerial photogrammetry or even satellite photogrammetry to actually assemble building inventories. There's a project going on at Oak Ridge about that. So you can have a sort of building infrastructure. So instead of having darts like what we had, now you really know what kind of, or well you can make an estimate of what kind of a building this is. And that's, you know, so if you take the criterion I just mentioned, 48 hours, uh, sorry, 24 hours out, can we estimate number of buildings? Probably from the address points we get a rough idea of that. It's not perfect because like uh, commercial businesses have one dot, but there could be, you know, storage buildings and a couple of sheds. And I mean, it's, yeah, in re residential homes, it's okay. One dot for one building, but for commercial, it's more complicated. Um, so it would be better if we were working not with dots, but with, with building inf infrastructure coverages. And then you could translate the forecast of water into the translation impact assessment better than we can now. I have a question. Yes. Uh, is this a, a flood inundation map? Mm -hmm. In some areas, uh, neighborhoods or uh, uh, areas, they become inundated, not necessarily because of the water level in the rivers too uh -huh. high, but because of the uh, local capacity sewer system yeah, yeah. is not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah uh, exactly. So this mapping uh, uh, capability? That's a very good question. 
I happen to be the chairman of the National Academies Committee on Urban Flooding right now, which is commissioned by FEMA to study this question. So we've been travelling around the country and we've been having a whole internal debate about how to do that. And fortunately we visited Houston the month before Harvey happened, so we had a good idea about Houston uh, pre-Harvey. Um, we were in Phoenix last week. Um, and in Phoenix, a lot of that kind of thing happens. Actually, you know, you've got Camelback Mountain, the water sort of slopes down and it rains like crazy and <laughs> just goes straight through the subdivision. There's no river involved at all. So, yeah, that's, a, that's so, uh, no, I, I really can't say too much because, you know, there's some confidentiality issues involved with these things until they're published. But uh, let's say that subject is under, um, under consideration. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, a lot of said about how Houston's, uh, you know, problems were made worse by the fact that it's all paved and not so. It, are you able to put some kind of a quantified factor on something as opposed to Phoenix, which is just non absorbent uh, baked clay? Okay, so here's, here's a critical fact. The 100 year, 24 hour rainfall, design rainfall for Phoenix is 3 inches three inches. For Houston it's 15. The same degree of extremity because Phoenix is a desert. They've got a forgiving atmosphere up there. It's dry. You, know, you have a flashlight in Phoenix? Yeah, you, it's okay. But basically they're living in a benign location for major flooding because there's just not much water in the atmosphere above Phoenix. Whereas Houston, you know, it's got this big sloppy atmosphere right next to the Gulf. There's lots of water up there and that can come down. That's the big thing that really affects the risk difference between Houston and Phoenix. Yes, both of them have developed in a kind of uh, cowboy fashion and what's really striking about, it, w let me just tell you, Austin is the Ritz. Austin is the Ritz for urban drainage. If you drive around Austin, you should feel really good. You are in the four seasons of urban drainage here in Austin. You look around and you see curb and gutter, you know, this, uh, this is storm sewer, storm sewer, storm sewer. You go to Houston, and, oh, I'm in this subdivision, oh, they've got ditches here. Um, and then you go into that subdivision, oh, I don't see anything. And then, oh, in this subdivision, oh, they've got some storm sewers, but they go this way. And oh, in this one, they've got storm sewers to go this way and this way. It's, it's a patchwork quilt. It's whatever the developer decided to do when that subdivision was built. And so it's everything. This is ev it's the, the people say Houston doesn't have zoning. <laughs> Houston doesn't have uniform control over the drainage, what's necessary. And so you're trying now, they're trying now to sort of retrofit what they had from the developer, whatever the developer decided to do. And they have a huge budget for this. So the city of Houston has a budget, $62 million a year just for retrofitting the storm sewer system, basically. Um, the biggest streams and so on in the Houston area are handled by Harris County. They have a $60 million a year budget for capital improvements out of local money and 20 million from the federal. So the total of that is $142 million. So $142 million on average, regardless of Harvey, is being spent every year just trying to fix things up. Now, Houston is trying to engineer itself out of trouble. They've got one project, which I have to say is the gold standard for a flood project. They're trying to lower Braze Bayou, and it costs $20 million an inch to do that. Now, if you want to lower Braze Bayou by an inch in a flood, that's 20 mil. Two inches, that's 40. And they've got a $120 million project to lower Braze Bayou by six inches. Um, they've got a great faith in engineering in Houston. I have to say that I'm feeling they're sort of approaching the upper limit somehow. But, uh, but it's uh, Phoenix, for example. Uh, Phoenix, they don't bother with storm sewers. <laughs> at all, at all. Just, oh, housing, it's great. Um, actually, they irrigate. They have, they have an irrigation system, so they're actually flood irrigating the lawns. They're artificially flooding themselves. So they have little berms and they have uh, turnouts and the whole lo the lawn gets flooded from the Central Arizona project. So in Phoenix, what, what's happening is they say, oh gosh, we need some storm sewers here. Uh, well, every half mile. So in other words, they, go, they count along the streets and they say, okay, that's one, and da, 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 that's one. Okay, we'll put storm sewers in, in every half mile if they're good. Uh, if you're not so good, it's every mile. <laughs> that's, what's happening. that's what's currently happening in Phoenix. The, now, I, on the other hand, I have to say, Phoenix is really good with blue-green infrastructure. They've got a very nice, um, it's a relatively mo n new city, and there's lots of things uh, showing uh, low-impact development, like little swales and uh, uh, ponding things where water could be ponded locally, and trees and grass and so on, and the Phoenix is great for that. I think they're doing a super job with that. Uh, the, 
the, but they're not so good on the, the you know, traditional urban drainage kind of systems, the um, storm sewers and that kind of thing. from mm. Texas uh, General Land Office yeah. and asking for uh, proposals, particularly teams, that on how to improve our community within. Mm -hmm. So it would be somewhere around like a half million to four million dollar per, per project uh, for a number of years. So I hope uh, this talk uh, given by Professor Menman will uh, generate or elevate some uh, interest for mm -hmm. Cross-discipline, cross-agency uh, uh, collaboration. Thank you again. Okay, you're welcome.